Good Shepherd. Thank you for joining Good Shepherd Baptist Church Church School study for today. And we're going to begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy that you've given to us. And we ask, Lord God, that you would bless the hearts and minds of everyone who's opening up your word. Let it be a refreshing to every one of us, the finished work of Christ and how through the ages you have brought him to us and to our brought this understanding to bear upon our faith. Let us be established therein. And we thank you, Lord God, for the blessings that you're giving to every family. Whatever the need happens to be in that family, Lord God, we are asking that you are the provider of that need and that there is praise and worship to come from you as you have done so. Lord, thank you. So many times you have given us exactly what we needed when we needed. We thank you for your word that does tell us that. Be a blessing this day in what it is that we study, that we ourselves might be more holy before you. Have walks that represent Christ in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the theme for Good Shepherd 2020 is going from good to great, exalting the Savior. The mission for Good Shepherd is winning souls through witnessing, teaching, making disciples, and ministering to the community. The lesson title today is called Through Heritage. Um, when I woke this morning before my alarm clock even sounded, I really was in a place of Lord I have done this study and yet I'm feeling that there is something more that needs to be said. And the spirit spoke to my spirit and simply said, tell the story. And I looked at what was going on with these writers today and that's exactly what they're doing. They are telling the story, retelling the story. Uh, it's timeless. In it, uh, it's in the first, this one is the first of three lessons in a new unit that we began today, the beginning of a call. And our printed text is found in Matthew chapter 1 and then Hebrews chapter 1. And they highlight the heritage of Jesus. Matthew is the re and, and the writer of Hebrews both urged the readers to recognize that Jesus is the Christ. They were to find the significance of this in his earthly heritage in Matthew. And in Hebrews, writings of his um, heavenly origin would help them the early believers uh, understand that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah and the Son of God. Well, the combined text in our lesson study tells us that the nature and the hearts of the early believers uh, in the church kind of went this way. They were coming out of the religion of Judaism. And there was some grounding that they had that they literally needed to shake loose or rather come into a greater understanding of what it was that was being taught in the laws of Judaism. There are three outlines. Jesus' diverse ancestry, Matthew 1, uh, 1 through 6, Jesus' place in history, uh, verses 16 and 17, and Jesus' true heritage, Hebrews 1, 1 through 5. Now, Matthew is an apostle and eyewitness of the early ministry of this earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a song that we sing. Everybody ought to know. It says it three times. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Well, he sets out to give a record of Jesus Christ and he begins at the beginning. His earthly ministry is connected then to his divine purpose and it's well documented in Old Testament scripture. So our first outline is of Jesus' diverse ministry, uh, ancestry, Matthew 1, 1 through 6. It reads, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amenadab. Amenadab was the father of Nason. Nason was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. 
Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David the king was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Now, now if you were asked, uh, who is Jesus? You might answer, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright in the morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And you wouldn't be wrong. But for uh, what purpose that we have Matthew writing about this Jesus line, this family line that Jesus is in? Well, M Matthew wrote primarily to Jewish readers, which tells us uh, what purpose he has for writing this detailed history of to introduce Christ. But this is not just about a family line. The ancestry significance to the Jews was not so much a badge of, of pride uh, or of honor. These verses speak to their customs and their connectedness to their spiritual lives. Jews would have a deeper uh, appreciation for the documenting of, of Matthew that Matthew gives here. So it's not a history lesson alone, not for them. It was about heritage. As we look at the accounts of these forefathers of Jesus, what is revealed is the promise of Yahweh, Jehovah God, to bring the Messiah into the world. Matthew begins with the father of promise, Abraham. There is one central point in, in this outline. Jesus is that Christ. By heredity, uh, Matthew shows that Jesus is the promised Messiah. What we have here is a summary of the journey of a people. Throughout the Old Testament, we can trace the coming of Christ through the volumes of the books. He's there in every generation. And there's a caption that says he's coming and God's fulfilling this, his promise to bring that Messiah and the Redeemer into the earth. Well, Matthew takes the time to show us then that Jesus is called through heritage. And what a colorful lineage it is too. We won't look at all of them, but if you take up uh, in your own private reading, uh, let me challenge you to do this. Don't just see the human existence of, the, of their lives, but also see beyond that. Let this study that we're having right now today remind us one attribute, attribute of uh, God our Father. He is faithful. God is also so very trustworthy, and at any time in history, you can find him taking care to look over his, trans, uh, his, his creation from the lineage we're studying right down to you and me today. We are part of that family and of that faithfulness. Okay, we find on this ancestral tree in the second verse, the names of the patriots, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Judah. Well, can we pause right there to see how God unfolds his will in the affairs of men, especially his own people, us. He is a God that does not change. We can agree with that. There are, uh, these are the patriarchs of the nation Israel. They are a people with a heart for God and they worship him. In the natural, all of these men are not the firstborn sons of their fathers. And, and I say that looking at the life of Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob. We recall how God used Joseph's entire life to illustrate his faithfulness. By Joseph's example, we see how uh, interconnected that we all are in the roles that we play in kingdom building and fulfilling God's eternal plan for his church. Joseph himself stated it plain to us. God takes all the evil and the lows, the hurts, the loss, the disparity, the pain, and then God uses all of that for his good. And right there, I've got to mention Jeremiah 29, 11. For we know the plans. I know the plans we have for you. I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Out of all that we suffer and we endure, God brings hope, prosperous futures, and eternal salvation. Uh, so let's just be obedient. We can't know how far that was. Uh, there, these obedient steps that we take will be reaching. In Joseph's role, we find him keeping the entire Hebrew people alive. And there in this lineage, we find him listed as one of the brethren of Judah. But the scripture credits Judah with uh, intervening to save Joseph's life when his brothers wanted to kill him. He, he could not know, Judah could not know 
at the time that saving his brother's life would one day save his own. We ought to look at that oftentimes when we witness to others that the encouragement that we give to them is sounding out in our own lives and giving our firm foundation another firm footing. And then one day, as we listen to that person who we may have led to Christ, talk about the goodness of the Lord, we're able to stand no matter where we happen to be in our faith, trusting God that it's always increasing. But wherever we happen to be, that will be a great encouragement to our own selves. But we do get a glimpse of the change of the heart of Judah in, in Genesis 44 as he made a plea to exchange his own freedom for the freedom of his younger brother. And he was asking that of Joseph. Hmm. In Genesis 49, his blessing that he received from Jacob, his father, reads like this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Both the scepter now refer to the kingdom rule and the title Shiloh carries a divine authority uh, and it points to the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. But as we continue to follow the ancestral line, uh, we find in verses 3 through 6, the destitute, the deprived take their place in history right alongside of the prosperous and the powerful. There are four strangers who are spoken of within this account. Strangers only means that they were uh, born Gentiles, but they have become converts to the Judean faith. Uh, three of them are women within the direct family line of Jesus. Tamar posed as a prostitute. Rahab was called a prostitute. And Ruth was a Moabite. Uriah then, the Hittite, had been the husband of Bathsheba. And following his death, his murder, Bathsheba became the wife of David and the mother of Solomon, all in the family line of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Uriah, these women, every one story in the lineage serves a purpose. The commentator writes this, their lives are lessons about the universality of the gospel and the grace of God towards humanity. That's us, all of us, humanity. See, even through the failures of kings and princes, our holy God keeps watch over his word to perform it. I have a question. It's printed there in our text. In what ways has God redeemed the negative parts of your family history and made them into something beautiful? And then the second question, how has your family included or embraced those who were not born into the family? Well, as you think about this, I'll just remind you that God is a faithful covenant keeper. The second outline connects Jesus's ancestry to his place in history. Uh, Matthew continues the genealogy through the coming of Jesus and concludes. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David unto the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away unto Babylon unto the Christ are 14 generations. Now, genealogies kind of link the experiences of a people group. In uh, the instance here, it is the Jewish people. When you search through the Old Testament scripture accounts, the lives of these individuals serve the purpose of pointing to Christ as the Son of God. The genealogy ends with the subject of this list. He is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Joseph is by marriage to the mother of Jesus, Mary, Joseph's father, excuse me, Jesus' father, at least in the eyes of the Jewish law. The Jewish people were Matthew's targeted audience. In verse 17, Matthew marks time, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Matthew marks time with historical events that separate 14 generations. Again, the genealogy and Old Testament writings all mark his journey, Jesus' journey. Matthew wants us to see Christ coming through the ages. In each Old Testament record and 
encounter with God teaches us of the faithfulness God has to keep watch over his word to perform it. He will keep his promises because he is a covenant God and he is a co and his word is his is who he is. Abraham is the father of faith. This is where um, Matthew begins. Abraham is the father of faith. God created for himself through Abraham a people. And, and he told him that all the earth would be blessed through him in Genesis 12, 13. But likewise, it was a promise to David that an eternal king would come from his seed in Psalms 89, 34. God established a nation for himself through the covenant he established with David. Okay. But God's perfect picture of redemption happens with the Babylonians. God redeemed his people from captivity that was not a physical one only, but a spiritual restoration. Upon their returning, the people of God, this Jewish nation, would no longer ever regard another God as having any place in their lives. He was the one and true God, restoration and redemption. In such a hard thing, the, Cabalon, the Babylonian captivity. But what lies before them is the coming of Christ and eternal salvation. Christ is their heir, is the heir of the covenant. He is the heir of the throne. And even in our days upon the earth, God is at work. He's moving his church forward to his glorious return. He's coming again. And the restoration of all things then will be to himself. Well, the final outline shows us that uh, Jesus' true heritage is found in Hebrews. So, what is the focus of Jesus that's found in the book of Hebrews? Hebrews is written at a, at a time of great turmoil in the early church. But not just the church only. All of Jerusalem is facing troubled times, just as in our world. Our entire world is facing troubled times. For them, it is nearly the time when Jesus prophesied that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. And I say to you that what connects us is not worshiping in a building. So now, against the backdrop of the Roman destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem, the writer of Hebrews gives uh, a history lesson of his own. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Long ago, God spake many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, he created the universe. Verse 3. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses his, the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Then, when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. <clears throat> this shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God that God gave him is greater than their names. The Son is greater than the angels. Verse 5, and God never said to any angel that he, what he said to Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. Amen. This is the uh, last outline in our study. Jesus' true heritage. Here, like in Matthew, the original readers were Jews who were now converts to the Christian faith. But I ask you, what do you do with all of that learning that they have been indoctrinated with since they were born? Well, the writer in Hebrews draws on it. He builds a perfect picture of Christ as the Son of God. The ancestry line of uh, in Matthew provides a foundation for the text in the first chapter of Hebrews. These Old Testament accounts of people listed in, in Matthew pieces together for us a perfect picture of Christ. 
now the central point in this scripture is Jesus is the Son of God and God has made him superior to all things. The idea of inheritance is a key concept in throughout all of um, Hebrews. We as believers everywhere are a part of the family of God if we follow Jesus in obedience to the faith. Well, Jesus is the Son of God and he's able to, to pass an eternal inheritance to all of us who follow him. We understand this by the dispensation of grace and by the Holy Spirit at work in our lives to bring knowledge to us according to John 16, 13. However, in Old Testament times, knowledge of the ways and will of God were gradually given to man. During Jesus' ministry um, here on earth, he states that in uh, John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Uh, for which the Jews took up stones to, to kill him. They understood that he was making himself to be equal with God. Well, understand that that is the same exact point that's being made here in Hebrew. In verse 3, not only is he a reflection of God's likeness, but Jesus possesses the power of the Almighty. He is making this one point. The second point, he is making all things come together and stay together by the word of his own power. And the other point, just as the act of redemption for our sins were performed once and never needed to be performed again, Christ died once for sin, and he did it for the whole world from the time of creation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for his sacrifice, God has elevated him to, to be seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. God has given Jesus a name that is above every name. Names were significant in ancient times, not just, uh, they, and they were just as important as heritage would have been. God has given Jesus an inheritance that is more excellent than any power or created being. Hmm. And God has given Jesus the, the love of his Father. In Matthew 3:17, God spoke in, in a voice from heaven, and he said, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Because of Jesus, who Jesus is and his sacrifice on the cross, we also have direct access to God. We do. No need for a temple in Jerusalem to worship God. And right where you are, you can praise and worship him too. Jesus said this of himself. I am the way, the truth. And the life, no man comes to the Father except through me. And he has open hands to invite every one of us to come and be a part of the family of God. That scripture is coming from John 14, 6. <clears throat> the writer of the Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, begins much the same way that um, Matthew has. He keeps the focus on Christ, that Messiah that was promised. Even though he begins by talking about God, he uses the reader's background in understanding what the prophets communicated to the forefathers. He begins to open their understanding that Christ is not just a promise from the past, but he is an eternal present uh, pre presentation of God going forward. Jesus, the Christ, is a present God with them and with us today. The Old Testament accounts are not to uh, are just used to, to lay a foundation for the faith that they have and that we also walk in. The Jews believed for a promised Messiah, no problem there. Hebrew teaches that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Messiah, and they had to come to that place of understanding. And being uh, one with the Godhead Trinity, Christ Jesus is the everlasting covenant that we and they will all have. And we will have this covenant with him forever. And what is that covenant? To be one with them, to be a part of the family of God. You see, there's no longer for them or for us sundry times and diverse manners. Those things have passed away. They are no longer there to teach us who Jesus is. This is the word of God.
and we must take it by faith and stand on it. Becoming a part of his family brings us into relationship with the Lord Jesus because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And because of the Spirit in us, we're able to continue our faith walk, representing well our Christ in this earth. I'm going to leave you with this scripture. It's found in Philippians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan, that at the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, verse 11, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. He makes everything work out according to his plan. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the rehearsing of this, this your word, the retelling of the story of the origin of Jesus. Even, Lord God, that we might be able to understand that from the foundation of the earth, your plan and your purpose was to bring man into a, a relationship with you. That you, Lord God, might be well pleased in the work of our hands and be, through the finished work of Christ. We thank you, Lord God, for bringing us our Savior. And you, you Lord Jesus, for being obedient to be the sacrifice that was required to take away our sins. And now for this relationship that we have, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are always teaching us how to conduct ourselves, that we might represent Christ well in this world. Oh, we thank you, Lord God, for so many wonderful blessings that are ours. And we ask, Lord God, for whatever petition that might be on anyone's heart, that you hear it, for you are a faithful God. And we thank you for being that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.